Hey there, friends. Glad to be back with you again today as we are working our way through this all about that book study of Psalm 119. Such an amazing chapter. It's a long chapter. We're taking all year to work our way through it. And right now, we are in section 16. And we're going to talk about that today. You've been meditating on that section. You've been digging into it. You've been looking with me at the needs that we see David expressing. And then also his response to the Lord and his word after he expresses those needs. So I just want to spend our time together talking with you today about those things. We're just going to work our way through. I'm sure that some of the things I'm going to share are going to resonate with the things that you saw as well. And maybe some of the things the Lord will have me to share are going to be new thoughts for you, uh, some new insight for you. And I'm sure that you, as a student of God's Word, as a lover of God's Word, you have things to share too. So I pray that you would share them with me. I pray that you would share them with our community doing this study on our social media platforms. And I pray that you would share them with other people. The Word Word of God is alive and active and it needs to be shared. We need to share it with ourselves. We need to share it with others. As we do so, we build one another up in the Word of God. So let's just do that now as I share together with you and you zoom in with me and center in on these amazing verses found in section 16. So in your meditation, you saw that I, you know, really pointed us to kind of categorizing some needs that David is expressing. He's expressing many needs as we work our way through the first six verses of the eight verses in this section. But I kind of grouped them into categories and then I encouraged you to find a theme for those categories. And that might have been challenging. You might not have been able to do it in that one to three words. Maybe you gave it more of a sentence. You know, there's no um, failing grade or passing grade on that. That was just a challenge of, of mental and spiritual thought for us to be able to really think about what kinds of needs is he expressing. And for me, the first grouping of those found in the first few verses, I gave the theme of salvation. And I want to explain to you why. David begins in verse 121 by saying this, I have done justice and righteousness. Do not leave me to my oppressors. This is a prayer. He's, he's telling this to God. I have done justice and righteousness. Now, I don't know if you have ever said anything like this to God. Maybe you've not put it in those words, but perhaps you've said something like, God, after all I've done for you, after the way I've been serving you in this way or that way, God, I've been keeping your commandments. God, I've been walking with you. God, I did the right thing when it was really hard for me to do last week. Do you ever pray like that? Do you ever find yourself like looking at yourself and going, man, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing my best here, God. Can't you just give me something for that? Can't you just reward me? We have a tendency in our flesh to think that way sometimes. After all I've done for you, God, can't you do this for me? But when we get in the word of God, when we look at what the law of God really requires from us to be just and to be righteous before him, we quickly realize that that is not spiritually logical thinking. It doesn't line up. Because the righteousness of God is something we will never attain to on our own. What God requires from us, we can't measure up to it. We are not enough. It doesn't matter how much the world will tell you you're enough. You're not enough in the eyes of God. Left to your sinful self, even if you are doing so many good things for God, you're not enough and I'm not either. And so it's my perspective in these verses, others may disagree with me, and, and there are certainly perspectives to be discussed. But it's my perspective that that's what David's doing here. You know, he's so in need of God to save him from his oppressors that he's looking at himself and trying to find a reason why he should be able to convince God to do so. But like you and me, he quickly realizes uh, that's not going to work. Because when we look in the mirror, of God's righteousness, we know we are not enough. And so what does he say then in verse 122? He says, be surety for your servant for good. 
do not let the arrogant oppress me. There's definitely a sense of self-righteousness in verse 21, and maybe not necessarily in a bad way. I, there were a lot of things that David and probably you and me are doing right in the eyes of God. But when we look into the face of his righteousness, then in verse 122, there is a sense of humility, a sense of God, I need you to save me. I need you yourself to be the surety for your servant. God, I am your servant and I'm doing my best to do what you call me to do, to live just, to live righteous before you. But God, in all reality, I am not a reason for you to be good to me. You yourself are gonna have to be that surety for me. When David said surety, what he's asking for is a guarantee. Kind of like if somebody co-signs on a loan, like they're guaranteeing that there's going to be payment for that. David is saying, will you guarantee to me based on who you are, not who I am, but who you are, God, that you will save me from my oppressors, that you will not let them oppress me. You know, we see this several times in uh, God's word servants of God who really are seeking God like David is here, who really are doing righteous things, come to the place where they realize they are not enough. They need salvation and they realize salvation is only found in God alone. We see this in the book of Job, in Job 17 verse three. I wanna read that for you now. He says this, he says, lay down now a pledge for me with yourself. Who is there that will be my guarantor? In other words, who else can guarantee God but you? In the book of Hebrews, we also read this. Now, in the book of Hebrews, we don't know specifically who wrote it. A lot of people think Paul wrote it. Again, somebody who had been self-righteous in his own eyes and then came to the very clear realization that he had no righteousness. Everything that he had done before coming to Christ, he actually qualifies that and categorizes it as trash in the book of Philippians. But in the book of Hebrews, this is what Paul writes in chapter seven, verse 22. He says that Christ has become the guarantor for salvation. He's become the guarantee for our salvation. And so even here in this Psalm, 119, section 16, these first two verses, we're getting a glimpse of Jesus. Again, David did not know Jesus. Jesus had not come as the Savior yet, but there are many times in the Psalms that David writes that we see these glimpses, these prophetic like glimpses of Jesus. And I think that's what it was in the book of Job. I think it's what it is here in these first verses of section 16 in Psalm 119. And then it's definitely revealed in the book of Hebrews. Godly people seeking to do righteous things realize in and of themselves they're not enough for salvation. Whether it be that initial salvation when God saves us from our sin, or whether it be those day-to-day -day times that we need him to step in, like David did here, and to deliver him from his oppressors. David needed salvation. And he realized the only guarantee of that salvation is in God alone. God would have to provide that guarantee. Surely he had done some righteous things. Surely he had favor in God's eyes. But a guarantee, a guarantee that it will never fail? Oh, only God, the righteousness of God, is that kind of guarantee. In verse 123, David goes on to express that need where he says, my eyes fail with longing for your salvation and for your righteous word. In other words, God, I have been looking and looking and looking day after day after day for you to save, for you to save, for you to give the word that you are on the move, to give the word that's gonna bring this breakthrough with my oppressors. God, my eyes have just been straining to see it and they're failing. I haven't seen it yet. And I know that many of us can relate to that. I know in the, in the season of challenge that my family is walking through, I have not seen it yet. My eyes have failed with a deep, deep longing again and again and again. And yet, I'm gonna keep looking to the Lord because I know that he is the guarantee. 
because of his righteousness. You know, a lot of times now in New Testament thinking, understanding that Christ, his shed blood was shed for us to give us victory over sin and to give us abundant life. We um, will say things like, we plead the blood of Jesus. In other words, if you were standing in a courtroom, you would plead why you should be able to have freedom or be declared not guilty. Well, in the, the courtroom of, of the Most High, the only thing we can plead is the blood of Jesus. That's the only reason that we can ask for God to save us, to save us from sin, that, that first moment of salvation, but to save us again in those day-to-day -day things like for my family. So I'm pleading the blood of Jesus daily. I'm coming before him and saying, you are the guarantee. Your sacrifice, your blood is the guarantee for my salvation. My eyes have failed with longing, but I know your salvation is not going to fail. I'm waiting to see it. And I love that David still has his eyes on the Lord for salvation, even though his eyes have not seen it yet. You might remember back in section 15, David said, do not let me be ashamed of my hope. He has hope because he knows that the Lord is the guarantee. And we can have that same hope for salvation. David is in great need. He is in great need of salvation. And he realizes that God himself is the guarantee of that salvation. But as the verses continue, we find that David is still expressing more needs. And uh, this would have been another category of needs that I called you to give a, a theme and to try to do that in one to three words. That was probably pretty challenging. It was for me too. But what I landed on is this, experiential truth. Experiential truth. David had a need for experiencing truth. He didn't wanna just read the truth he wanted to know it, to understand it, to live in it. See, in verse 124, he says, deal with your servant according to your loving kindness and teach me your statutes. He had a need for God to deal with him according to the truth of who God is. God himself is love. And he expresses that love through his hesed love, his loving kindness that goodness, that kindness, and that faithfulness. And so David has this need, he's saying, God, deal with me according to your loving kindness. Almost going back into those earlier thoughts of, I don't deserve it enough of myself, but God, deal with me that way. And then he also wants to experience the truth in that he wants God to teach it to him. We've heard this all throughout this Psalm, David continually crying out to the Lord, teach me, realizing he still doesn't know it all. He still has much to learn. There are still places in his mind, in his heart, in his will, his emotions, his thoughts that need to be touched with the truth of God's word. He wants to experience it. He wants God himself to teach him. And then in verse 125, he says, I'm your servant. Like God, I'm here, I'm ready. But he says, give me understanding. He wants that experience of truth to be something that is understood in his mind, not just facts that he can rattle off, but when somebody asks him, what does that mean to you? What does that look like in your life? He wants to have that kind of understanding to how the truth gets experienced in a person's life. He wants to understand the, the depth of wisdom in God's law. And so he's asking for it. He's expressing that need before the Lord. And he says he wants that so that he can know the testimonies of God. In this word, know, it's this idea of be intimate with the testimonies of God. Again, not just know the stories of God's word, the things that God had done in the past, but to actually know them, to know them to where he lives in them and he experiences them. David has come to the point in his journey with God's word that he realizes the word of God is alive and active. Now those words had not been penned yet. They are New Testament words, but I believe David knew the word of God was something way beyond just words on a page, words on a scroll. The words of God are life and David wanted to experience them. He wanted God to deal with him according to the word. 
He had a need for God to teach him. He had a need for God to give him understanding. He had a need for God to help him to know the testimonies. He wants to experience the truth in his life. And I believe that need needs to be great in our life too. It needs to be great in our life too. We need to recognize how needy we are for the word of God, not just to know the facts of it, not just to have a quick little sweet quiet time that makes us feel warm and fuzzy in the morning, but no, that word gets into our lives, that we do know the testimonies of God. We walk in them. When we're in the fire, we remember how the Lord himself showed up in the fire when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were there. We, we, we experience his presence in our own fire. I know I certainly have over these last five months of this year as my family's been walking through this deep, fiery challenge. God's presence has been there. I, I know that testimony now. I'm intimately acquainted with it. David has a need to experience the word of God. And we do as well. We do as well. I, I pray that you can identify with that need and express these needs to the Lord, just like he did. But he moves on again in verse 126 with another need. And this one he's pretty bold in expressing. I didn't ask you to give this one a theme. I think it's pretty obvious. David wants the Lord to act. He is ready for the Lord to act. He says to God, it's time for the Lord to act. In other words, God, I need you to do something here. Have you ever said that to God? Have you ever said, God, it's got to be today. I can't wait a moment longer. It's time for you to act. And for David, the reason is because they have broken the law. In the message paraphrase, it's worded, for they have made shambles of your revelation. And you know, that would be a very righteous reason for us to be very bold with God and say, it's time for you to act. You know, as I look out at the culture we live in, yes, in our country, which by the way, is the greatest country in the world, there's still so much richness and blessing of God here. And I humbly thank him for that. But I think we can all acknowledge our country is a hot mess right now. And we look beyond our country, beyond the borders of our country, the world is a hot mess right now. The world has made shambles of God's revelation. We need God to act. We, we need to cry out to him to act, to move, to, to save the innocent babies' lives that are being slaughtered every day across this planet. We need him to act and to set things right in the minds of people, to set us free from the immorality that has just shifted to where we don't even have any common sense about male and female. Now, those are two huge things in the world, but we all know that that stuff, it's built upon foundations that have been laid for years where people have been walking in false ways. They've made shambles. They've destroyed the law of God, the truth, the teaching, the knowing, the experience of God's word in their lives. And because of that, these horrific things have risen to the surface among many others. We need God to act. But you know, we can say that personally in our own lives as well. There are times that you've probably said, God, I need you to act today. It's time for you to act. David said earlier, my eyes have failed with longing for your salvation. God, I'm so ready to see you move. One of the wonderful things that we can know about the Lord from his word is that he is always on time, <laughs> that he is perfect in all his ways. So we express that to the Lord in our mind, in our heart, the way we're seeing the world, the way we're seeing things in our life. We're like, God, it's gotta be today. It's gotta be this minute or I'm not gonna make it. But yet also know the truth. Be willing to be taught the truth that God's ways and his timing are perfect. They're perfect. I know when I spent the time doing what I asked you to do on day six about filling in that statement, just letting the Holy Spirit just take your thoughts to just fill it in again and again and again. That statement that says, it's time for the Lord to act for, and then fill in that blank. Once I got started on that, I just 
looking back in my life when I've been in those places of desperation, just writing out description after description after description and reminding myself he did act. He did come forth in his perfect timing. He was faithful. He did meet me in that. He did act. Oh, what a good, good God. And even as I continued in that process, writing things out that are present right now, that are such important things where I'm ready. I want it to be today. My eyes are looking. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm looking to see his salvation. To give me faith as I looked back and wrote about all those other things that he did act on to know he's faithful and he is going to act. Oh my goodness, David is expressing some very deep, some very great needs in these verses of section 16, these first six verses. But he shifts, he shifts and it's his response. We know that because the very first word in verse 127 is therefore. In other words, God, I have all these needs and I've got my eyes looking upward and my ears open to heaven. I've got all these needs. Therefore, I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. I love that David, you know, uh, clarifies that. You know, I don't think he's just talking about gold here. I think he's just speaking in terms of the wealth of the world, the riches of the world, the things that matter to the most to him in this world. What are the things that matter the most to you? Do you love the commandments of God above those, even the most fine of things in your life, the, the things that would be at the top of your list of wealth in your life. Do you love the commandments of God above that? And if we don't, if you didn't see your life, your, your heart, your emotions, your affections lining up with that truth from verse 127, that we cry out to the Lord with a need there as well, God, I know I need to be there. I'm not there yet. Help me to be there. And then in verse 128, he has such a powerful response, a deeply powerful response when he says, therefore, I esteem right your precepts concerning everything. Like I have elevated your precepts to be right concerning everything. Like I've decided, God, whatever you say, it's always right. Even if I don't know it yet, even if I'm not aware of that precept yet, even if I haven't been taught it yet, everything you say, God, it's right. It's right. David is all in with the word of God. That's his response. He looks at his needs. He talks to God about those needs. And then he says, everything you have to say is true. <laughs> everything you have to say is right. In the NASB version, he says, I esteem right your precepts concerning everything. In some of the other versions, it says, I honor. I like both of those terms because the esteem really to me happens internally, in our heart's affection, in our mind, our thoughts, right? That, that's that esteeming on the inside of us. Honor also is, is internal, but honor gets expressed. And so it's not just a, a mental or emotional nod to the precepts of God, but he's saying, I honor them. Everything you say is right, and I'm gonna honor them in my life. And then he makes this last statement. He says, this is his last response. He says, I hate every false way. And we've seen that before from David, and he's declaring it again. And I would say to you, and I say to myself, I need to keep declaring that in my life. I hate every false way, every single one of them. As much as he loves every precept of God, he hates every false way. And we need to as well. Again, if your life doesn't line up with those responses, ask God. Put this, these last two verses in the need category versus the declaration category in your life. This can be part of the need as well. Friends, we are so needy before the Lord. Even in our best efforts, our righteousness are as filthy rags before him. And yet he's such a good God that he meets us where we are. And he does become the guarantee of our salvation. Christ is the guarantee. His blood. We plead his blood over our lives. And we can come to him morning by morning with those needs. I know that he will meet us with his new mercies. I hope that you have found 
encouragement, identity, uh, challenge in this section, and that it will continue to speak to you and be a part of your own prayers before the Lord for many days to come. I'll see you again in section 17.